within the context of authentic audio documentation, a remarkable sequence of events emerges, featuring multiple incursions by UFOs into the guarded airspace of a joint USAF-RAF military base. This extraordinary situation is characterized by close interactions between Air Force personnel and UFOs unfolding continuously over several consecutive days. I'm on a journey of discovery. I'm seeking answers to some of the most challenging mysteries that face mankind and many nuggets of knowledge that could bring those answers or unsolved cases and tales of the strange and unexplained. This show focuses on recounting cases and stories of the unknown phenomena, mysterious events, weird places, and the unexpected. So please make sure to like, subscribe, and comment your thoughts on the case we are about to cover. I'm going to share my screen here and we are going to get straight into this one. I was having some technical difficulties, but everything is okay now. So this story takes place in Suffolk, South England on three separate days in December of 1980, December 26th, 27th, and 28th. And the first UFO encounter occurred at 3 a.m. on Friday, December 26th, 1980. About 40 people, including some military per military personnel from the base nearby and people living around the area, saw a bright light driving into the Rendlesham Forest, right outside where the base's territory ended. And two of the base's security team, Sergeant James Penniston and Sergeant John Burroughs, as we're seeing right here on screen saw it as well and Burroughs was pretty quick to guess that they were looking at it at a crashed civilian plane that was the first thing that came to mind especially since there weren't supposed to be any military flights happening during that time frame and thinking that there might be survivors or a fire, they didn't waste any time and they headed straight over there to check it out. And along for the ride into the woods were two other higher ups, Chandler and Chabinsag. And here is where things get really weird because the deeper they went into the forest, the more their radios started freaking out, going in and out with audio. So Chandler hung back to stay in touch with the base security control and Chapinsag wasn't too keen on going any further either. So that left Penniston and Burroughs to go alone and they were the only ones who actually got pretty close to whatever was hidden in the forest that night. And I had the pleasure to have John Burroughs on my show, Shifting the Paradigm, and he goes into detail on what happened that night. So let's listen to what he has to say. We were on duty. It was our last midnight shift. It was about three o'clock in the morning. We came on at 11. And so we came on it as Christmas was ending and we went into Boxing Day over in the UK. So it was about three o'clock in the morning when I was riding around with my supervisor and he saw something strange in the sky going into the forest. He got my attention to look to see what he was seeing. He asked me if... Uh, if I'd ever seen anything like that, I'd been there over a year and a half. And I said, no. So at that point, we decided we we better take a closer look before we say anything. So we went ahead and opened up the back gate. It was the east gate. It was on Woodbridge base. It was the, it was the twin bases, the Bentwaters and Woodbridge. We uh, drove down. There was a road that left the gate all the way down to a T where you could go left to Bentwaters right to a small village. I don't remember the name of it now. And but right there at the end of the road is where the forest was. It started. And that's where the, you could see the lights. So kind of did a U-turn at the T. Um, so the car was the door where I was on facing getting out. I got out. And immediately when I opened the door, it felt weird. There was like a static electricity in the air. Things just didn't seem right. And I don't want to say we felt like we were in danger, like severe danger, but because we were off base, hadn't told anybody, and something weird was seemed to be going on, we, we got back up to the gate right away and called it in. From that point, they didn't really believe us. It was Christmas night. The desk sergeant thought we were pulling a joke on him. It's pretty laid back that night anyway. They were playing music on one of the frequencies, Christmas music. But 
we persisted, so he transferred us to CSC. And at that point, we filled them in, or Sergeant Stephens did at that point. They put me back. They put me back on the phone. I added some more things that we were seeing. They sent a security patrol down to the uh, gate to verify what we were seeing. And that's the weird thing about this, about this short recording. And I have so many more to share with you. But first off, he goes back to the base and his higher ups think, oh, you must be joking with us. Come on. It's the Christmas holidays. Lighten up. Don't be telling jokes like this. But in reality, they were seeing something very strange in the forest. And this is a very, very consistent theme that we have seen time and time again when it comes with law enforcement or military officials. The first thing that comes to mind is, oh, it must be a joke. <laughs> so funny. When in reality, it's not. And so Burroughs and Peniston experienced a pretty surreal encounter in the forest where, as he had mentioned in this clip, there, like the atmosphere was electrified. And this really intensified their journey toward these unexplained lights. Because just imagine, okay, just let's just use our imagination just for a moment here. You are already looking at something that's kind of odd. You're into the forest in the middle of the night. This is 3 a.m. And then as you begin to walk closer and closer to whatever is in the center of the forest, it feels like you're walking through deep, heavy water. And this is actually how we described it a little bit later on. While there was this level of electricity in the atmosphere, it was very difficult to walk through the forest like something was kind of holding them back what would be going through your mind if you were to encounter something like that please let me know in the live chat let me know in the comments i do try to read all of the comments but this is something that we hear sometimes but it's it's a more of a rare detail to hear that aspect a lot of the times when it comes to a ufo encounter of any sort it's uh in some cases it might be t telepathic communication or like just this gut feeling of there is danger but John Burroughs said here he didn't want to see that they felt there was danger, but it felt really odd. And that's something that I find really interesting here. But it gets even weirder because as they're getting closer to this object, there's this big burst of light. And Peniston, on, on one hand, is seeing an object while Burroughs, he goes unconscious. And so as the light receded, revealing an unknown craft... Peniston looks at this and he sees these unfamiliar hieroglyph-like symbols that he writes down in his journal. And we are seeing that picture here of an, an actual photo of his notebook. And he felt so compelled to touch this warm craft. And he, as the story goes, allegedly, he experiences a flood of binary code upon contact with the rough textured symbols. And we're going to get into that a little bit more. Also, John Burroughs is going to go into that detail as well. So do keep that little piece of information in mind because we will revise it. But before we continue, if you are in enjoying the show, hit that like button. Let me know that you are enjoying it and also tell YouTube, hey, we like this kind of content. And so glad to see everyone in the live chat saying hi. Hi there. It's so good to see everyone here. And so the after this, after Peniston touches this craft, he gets this download, as we call it today, and he writes all this stuff down. The craft then ascended silently and disappeared at an impossible speed, leaving behind a charged silence and physical evidence in the form of ground indentations, which is an incredible detail. In many instances, UFOs don't leave anything behind. You see it, and it's the last thing you have is your memory, and that's it. And you better hope for the best that your memory is actually good. In this case, for this particular story, there were three indentations on the ground shaping a perfect triangle. And we're also going to get into that in just a moment as well. But with this, they were kind of confused. And after like the kind of they left and returned back to the area only to discover a puzzling loss of 45 minutes. So this 
several second encounter that they believe to have been several seconds, maybe a minute, was actually 45 minutes. So when they returned to the base, the, everyone's like, where were you? What's going on? You were gone for so long. What happened? And they said, well, we were just gone for a little bit. We were just checking something out, but that that's about it. And they said, no, 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 you were gone for 45 minutes. They look at their watches and those comrades were correct. They were gone for a lot longer period of time than they expected. And you have to listen to this next clip. It got really bright, then it dimmed, and then it took off. It just, you know, bright. When we saw it, it dimmed down and it got, it kind of got brighter again. Then it went up into the trees and departed. The other individual with me has gone on the record saying that he walked around it, touched it, saw gliss on it, had a download. So, but the two of us, Kabansek and I, we don't remember any of that. Um, we just remember getting close to it. Which is interesting because when you are dealing with witnesses, especially more than one, you're going to hear different stories. In this case, there were actually three witnesses that encountered this, but the more famous ones is Jim Penniston and John Burroughs. But as you heard, John Burroughs mentioned another person who hasn't really come forward and has shared his experiences as compared to Penniston and Burroughs. But you have two very different aspects, two very different experiences. You had Burroughs who went unconscious, and then you had Jim who claimed that he had a download and he received binary code, which we're going to get into, as I mentioned, just a little bit later on because he didn't reveal that information until several decades later. So after John and Jim tell the base what happened, Others, at first, they kind of joked around. They're like, oh, this is such a funny joke, but it's Christmas. It's not Halloween. Stop playing. Stop playing with us. But a little bit later, others actually went to investigate it um, after, after they brushed off the joke. And then as things kind of began to calm down, the unimaginable happened. The UFO came back. It was the night of December 27th during an awards dinner for a combat support group at Woody's Bar. And both the base commander, Colonel Ted Conrad, and his deputy, Charles Halt, remember that name, were in attendance. And in the middle of the event, Lieutenant Bruce Elgand uh, looked utterly stunned and he came in and he pulled Halt to the side and he just dropped a bombshell and he says, it's back. And a puzzled Halt, he, he, he asked, what's back? And Lieutenant says, the UFO, sir. And this, this is where it gets really good. And this is Halt right here when he was younger and how he looks uh, many years later. And deciding that they needed to document this, Halt formed a team. And they geared up with a camera, a, a cassette recorder, and that Halt typically used for verbal notes during his base inspections. And they also packed a Geiger counter to check radiation levels, extra batteries, multiple, mi multiple micro cassettes, and flashlights. So these guys were prepared. And that is amazing because you need all of those things when you're doing any kind of investigation, but very specifically when you're doing UFO investigations, right? So they didn't forget the starlight scope for night vision, and they also threw in some utility jackets because, after all, it was December, and the crew was ready to face whatever was out there. So Colonel Halt and his team, they neared the UFO sighting spot where Burroughs and Penniston said, okay, it's kind of in this area, and then... Halt started recording what he was witnessing. And there is a 17-minute audio which hit the public in 1983, three years after the Erie incident. And it captured a particularly intense moment, which I will share with you here. But if you do want to listen to the entire audio recording, that link will be in the description box below once this live show is over. But let's get into the aspect of what he's describing as as soon as he enters the scene. 150 feet or more from the initial, I should say, suspected impact point. Having a lift car, you can't get the line all the work. There seems to be some kind of mechanical problem. Let's send back, get another light. 
meantime, we're going to take some readings for the Gatter Connor and uh, chase Ron here a little bit, wait for the light off to my pants. So while this clip is very short, this is how the recording starts, how the halt recording, the halt, this, this, this cassette recording starts out. And I find it fascinating, first off, that it was even disclosed to the public in 1983, three years after the incident, the Rendlesham Forest incident, right? But on top of that, we're able to practically hear what's going on in real time. And so upon arrival to the area, Halt's focus shifted to the nearby trees circling the clearing, and he observed aloud, this looks like an abrasion on the tree, and then later on, later asked to take a sample. And what I love about playing these types of recordings for you that are, that become declassified, right, that come from law enforcement and military officials, is that we are witnessing what they are witnessing, what they're feeling, what they're encountering in real time, with every detail getting captured in spontaneous commentary. It's not scripted. And so, that's something that I find so profound about these clips. A big reason to why I like doing these specific types of shows is for that aspect in particular. But let's listen to this next segment. Yeah. One of these trees that fades into the blast, what we assume is a landing site, all have an abrasion facing in the same direction towards the center. The same let's, direction. Let's, let's go the rest of around the circle here. Turn it back down here. Let me see that. You want that's kind of funny. That's, that's, you're right about the abrasion. I've, I've never seen a tree that's... Uh, I've never seen a pine tree that's been damaged to react that fast. Yeah, I've got a bottle to put that in. Yeah, you got a sample bottle? We'll just put this for the soil. Put the tire or something. Yeah, here, let's take this on the ground. Oh, thank you. You'll notice they're all the same. Okay, from now on, let's that's, that's, that's identify that as point number one. Let's stake there. So you all know where it is. We have to sketch it. You got that set of novels? Yes, sir. Well, okay. But while investigating the area, they see a light in the sky. It is looking directly overhead. One can see an opening in the trees plus some freshly uh, broken pine branches on the ground underneath. Looks like someone came off about 15 to 20 feet up. Some small branches about an inch or less in diameter. 148, we're hearing very strange sounds out of the farmer's barnyard animals. They're just very, very active, making an awful lot of noise. Yes, yeah, there's a pigmentation. You just saw a light yeah, where? Wait, I'm going to down. Where? Right on this position here, straight ahead, in between the tree. There it is again. Watch. Straight ahead off my flash right there, yeah, sir. There it is. Oh, yeah, I see it too. What is it? We don't know, sir. So, yeah, can I get some of Yeah, it's a strange, small red light. It looks to be out maybe a quarter to half mile, maybe further out. I'm going to switch off. The light is gone now. It was approximately 120 degrees from back the site. Again. Is it back again? Yes, sir. Oh, that's the flashlight set. Let's move out to the edge of the clearing so we can get a better look at it. See if you can get the star scope on it. The light's still there, and all the barnyard animals have gotten quiet now. Yeah, we're heading about 110 to 120 degrees from the site. I'm through to the clearing now. Still getting a reading on the meter. About two clicks. Meter's jump three to four clicks. Getting stronger. Now it's uh, Now it's coming up. Hold up. There we go. It's about approximately four foot off the ground. It's coming to the of 110 degrees. All right, just turn the meter off. You've got to say that again. About four feet off the ground, about 110 degrees, getting a reading of about four clicks. Yes, sir. Yeah, but it... <coughs> no, it's dying. No, it's dying. I think it's something other than the ground. I think it's something that's something it's variable here. tree right over. We just found the first night bird we've seen. We're about 150 or 200 yards from the site. Everything else is just deathly calm. There is no doubt about it. There's some type of strange flashing red light ahead. Yeah, it's yellow. I saw a yellow tinge in it, too. Weird. It, it, it appears to be maybe moving a little bit this way. It's, it's brighter than it has been. Yellow. It's coming this way. Awesome. It is definitely coming this way. Pieces of it are shooting off. There is no doubt about it. This is weird. It'll last. Yeah, definitely moving off. Two, two lights. Two one light to the front, okay. one light to the left. Keep the flashlights off. There's something very, very strange. 
Keep the headset on. See if it gets any stronger. Right. Okay. Let, give us, give us a right now. It says it's on a beta reading, too. It's on a beta reading? Beta okay. Still has been removed. Okay. This is we're falling off it again. But it just moved to the right. Yeah. It got to the right. Strange. Oh, well, why don't you get left? Let's, let's approach to the edge of the woods up there. Can you want to do a lot of lights? Let's do it carefully. Come on. Okay, we're looking at the thing. We're probably about two to three hundred yards away. It looks like an eye winking at you. It's still moving from side to side. And when you put the star scope on it, it, it sort of has a hollow center, a dark center. It's, it's you know, like a pupil of an eye looking at you and winking. And the flash is so bright to the star scope that uh, it almost burns your eye. We passed the, the, the farmer's house and across in the next field. Now we have multiple sightings of up to five lights with a similar shape and all, but they seem to be steady now rather than a pulsating or glow with a red flash. We just crossed the, the creek and uh, we're getting what kind of readings now? Getting through three good clicks on the meter and we're seeing strange lights in the sky. At 244, we're at the far side of the farmer's second farmer's field and made sighting again about 110 degrees. This looks like it's clear off to the coast. It's right on the horizon. Moves about a bit and flashes from time to time. Still steady or red in color. Also, after negative readings in the center of the field, we're picking up the slight readings, uh, four or five clicks now on the meter. 305, we see strange uh, strobe-like flashes to the uh, rather sporadic, but there's definitely something there. Some kind of phenomenal. 305, at about uh, 10 degrees horizon, uh, directly north, we've got two strange objects, uh, half moon shape, dancing about with colored lights on them. That uh, gets to be about 5 to 10 miles out, maybe less. The half moons have now turned into full circles. As though there was an ellip eclipse or something there for a minute or two. Zero three fifteen. Now we've got an object about ten degrees directly south, ten degrees off the horizon, and the ones in the north are moving. One's moving away from us. They're moving out fast. This one on the right takes away too. Now we're both heading north. Okay, here, here he comes from the south. He's coming toward us now. Now we're observing what appears to be a beam coming down to the ground. This is unreal. Here's Eagle 330, and the objects are still in the sky, although the one to the south looks like it's losing a little bit of altitude. We're turning around and heading back toward uh, the base. The object, to the, the object to the south is still beaming down lights to the ground. So we're 100 hours, one object still hovering over Woodbridge Base at about 5 to 10 degrees off the horizon, still moving erratic and similar lights and beaming down as earlier. There are many things to talk about when it comes to this particular segment. First off, I love the way that Halt is expressing um, his what he's seeing, comparing this object to like someone blinking at him. But very specifically, one thing that really caught my attention, aside from the descriptions that we're going to get into, but it's, that's weird. That's interesting. And for him to just drag that word out, it in. From my perspective, it looks like you just cannot find other words to express what he's seeing. And so when you drag out words like that, it's kind of filling in those gaps. At least that's my interpretation of it. But also, on a side note, I love the way that he speaks. It's it's so clean. It's so precise as well, I believe is the proper word. And it I could probably listen to him read a whole audiobook if if he gave me the opportunity to do so if he ever did one but um that's one thing but the other aspect is consistently he is documenting times it's 305 it's 310 it's 312 and he while he's documenting that time he's going and saying i'm seeing this i am seeing that and he's going into detail on what these look like like an eclipse like a moon that this object is blinking at him it's changing colors kind of a reddish hue as well and you're going to need to remember those details because they're going to be prevalent a little bit later when we get into the potential explanation on what these guys are seeing but also he mentions and this is a very cool detail he mentions there was a beam of light on the ground as well. And 
In November of 2007, at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., Holt stated, We spotted multiple objects to the south. One of them zoomed in super fast, shooting a focus beam right near where we were standing. Another one projected beams into the weapons area zone. Okay, why is that important? Why is that important? Because years later the public discovered that the RAF Bent Waters was actually a storage site for nukes. Mm -hmm. And why is that prevalent? Well, if you have been studying this even just a little bit, there is this connection between UFOs and nukes, right? And the question is, are they monitoring these weapons? Are they disabling them? Are they just trying to trying just to map out where they are so that so that if they ever go off right they'll be ready so that we don't destroy our planet right is that a possibility i'm not sure but jimmy and i have done an entire show on nukes and ufos where there have been multiple cases in and around military installations that have carried nukes and having ufos nearby the the best example of this is the maelstrom air force base that that's that's the most famous one right next to the Vandenberg base in California, which is like the second most popular one. But when you look at this and then you begin to realize, oh, OK, now that we've found out that the RAF Bent Waters had a nuclear facility. OK, is there a connection here or or we need to ask ourselves just because there is a connection, does it mean that? that there is that it's a coincidence by any means right we have to ask ourselves these questions but it's something very interesting to bring up and in all of this we are able to hear Holt's explanation on what he's seeing but of course people want to know what exactly what Jim Burroughs saw so I'm going to play this next clip on how he describes it people always ask me what they look like to me I've always said they looked like like a, like a Christmas light display. There was different colors like red, green, blue. There was a, a bigger, like a light kind of, it, it seemed like they were in it almost, like a reddish, orangish hue. Um, we proceeded towards it. At one point, it, we might have even felt like we went past it. But eventually, after going through the woods for several minutes, we came to like a berm area and as we came up to the top of the berm, whatever it was, was in front of us. And here's a picture of John Burroughs and his dog, but also a sketch of what he think he, what he thought he saw that night as well. But then, but then you hear this from the Holt recording and in the aspect of, he says, take a picture, take a picture. And with this honestly just this whole case hearing what john burroughs has to say when he was on shifting the paradigm hearing uh the halt recording there's a lot of questions to this and hopefully you might be able to answer just a few of them but i think at the end of the day when it comes to the majority of cases we are left with a lot more questions than answers but you need to listen to this next clip okay why don't you take a picture of that and Remember your picture, and you gotta be writing this down. What's gonna be on the tape? Uh, got a tape measure with you? This is the picture. Your first picture will be at the first tree. The one between uh, Mark 2 and 3. Meantime, I'm gonna look at a couple of these trees over here. We are getting some. You're getting rains on the tree you're taking samples from on the side facing the suspected landing site. Four clicks, Max. Up to four. Interesting. That's right where you're taking the sample now. Four. That's the strongest point on the tree? Yes, sir. If you come to the back, there's no clicks whatsoever. No clicks at all on the back. It's all on the Maybe one side two. facing the... Interesting. The indentations look like something twisted as it got, you know, as it sat down on them. Looks like someone took something and sat it down and twisted it from side to side. Mm -hmm. Very strange. There he goes again saying, very strange, very strange. But at the very beginning of this audio clip, he says, take a picture, take a picture with a level of excitement. But at the same time, I think he's thinking to himself, get the evidence. But also they did 
as the tape recording goes, they did receive samples of some tree sap that had those odd abrasions on it. And they also looked at the indentations on the ground, which Jim Peniston did do a casting of a little bit later. Um, and I found that these people consistently they are reacting and acting very quickly, but in a smart way. They're not running away, but there's a protocol that they are following. And this is 1980. Yes, there has already been a little bit of interest in UFOs during this time frame, but it seems as if, and maybe I'm wrong here, I am not sure, but with the composure of Colonel Halt here, it seems as if he was trained for stuff similar to this on how to handle dealing with unidentified objects. Now, of course, that has to be a part of your training when you are in the military, especially when you are, when you have the mentality of everyone and everything is a threat, right? I get that. But here in this case, you hear a level of excitement, but also composure, a level of seriousness, which we haven't heard too often in other audio recordings before. And all of these things coming together, it adds this level of credibility to this case. But there is more to it because Burroughs mentioned that on the night of Sunday, December 28th, 1980, two days after their mysterious encounter, a massive U.S. Air Force C-5A cargo plane touched down at Bentwaters and it came all the way from Langley, Virginia, where the CIA headquarters is bringing with it a special investigation team complete with their own helicopters and gear. And the new squad had people from the Air Force Office of Special Investigations, known as the OSI. And Peniston shared that the OSI guys were pretty intimidating towards him and Burroughs. And they mentioned to these witnesses, write down all the details and all of this will just disappear. So which is already a weird statement to begin with. But Peniston spent time jolting down a four-page in-depth account on yellow legal pad. And after that, the OSI handed him a shorter, cleaned-up version of his story, telling him, all right, this is your story now, emphasizing that it was part of an ongoing investigation. And they made it clear, at least as the story goes, this is the official narrative you need to know by heart. So Peniston and Burroughs, by the way, were both, they both wrote down what happened. They gave it to the OSI and the OSI is like, oh yeah, this, this is great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here's already, I already wrote this down for you memorize it. And if anyone has any questions, you just got to say exactly what's on this sheet of paper. And so during this whole incident, Peniston revealed that he had sketched the strange symbols he had seen on the craft surface and showed them to these OSI questioners. And strangely enough, they didn't seem at all bothered by it. But amid all of these weird events, there's a theory that the military personnel actually saw just a lighthouse. What they were looking at, these weird lights in the sky, ones that were following them, they were able to just see the abrasions on the tree, indentions, uh, indentations on the ground. They're like, no, actually, what you saw, now, it wasn't Venus this time, it wasn't Mercury, but in fact, it was a lighthouse. And this explanation was created by James McGahey, a major in the U.S. Air Force. There were other suggestions that it might have been a meteor, but that's, of course, that's up for you to decide. But oddly enough, the go-to rationale for these high-strung encounters was something as mundane as a lighthouse. But was it actually? <laughs> was it actually? You need to listen to this next clip. It really happened. It wasn't the lighthouse, which that was the initial early on explanation they tried to give that we were fooled by the lighthouse not just one night but three nights because there was stuff that took place three nights in a row and we got real close to something both i did both night one and three and it wasn't the lighthouse so 
Burroughs is pretty confident that it wasn't a lighthouse. And people that have had encounters previously, especially the ones that we've covered here on Tales of the Strange and Unexplained, we, the public, and the witnesses are given very mundane explanations, but they know for a diddly darn fact that it's not the explanation that was given to them. And Cindy brings up a great question, and thank you so much for that. You're right. Um, Holt says, take pictures, take pictures. We would have hoped to have seen those pictures, right? No. I haven't come across any. I haven't seen them. We have pictures of Peniston's journal with his binary code and the hieroglyphs that he was able to write down that he saw from the craft. We're able to see lovely pictures of Rendlesham Forest, of the of the base, um, but the actual images of the object that was seen, there's going to be questions about it, and for the most part, if any have surfaced, um, they haven't necessarily been, they haven't been said, yep, these are the real deal. But th this story gets even stranger, okay? It, it's already been weird, but it gets even weirder because you have the media, a memo, and a cover-up, and all this gets heavily involved in this next clip where John speaks about CNN and wanting him to go on their show for an interview on the incident, going into detail on what happened. Now, remember, all right, he already had his meeting with the OSI, where he was given a sheet of paper and saying, yep, you're going to memorize this by heart. That's the story. And he goes into detail on this when I publicly spoke to him on Shifting the Paradigm about this case. And so you'll have to hear this next clip for yourself. I don't know how you got my number. Why are you bothering me? But I have no interest in talking to you. Please leave me alone. But they didn't. They kept calling me. But DeCaro, I listened to because he was mainstream press. And he basically told me that he was tasked through CNN, through the Pentagon to talk to me. And that he was coming out. And I said, well, I'm not going to talk to you. And he says, yeah, you will. So not only will you, I will be at your doorstep every day and at the base every day until you do. So at that point, I went to the base that afternoon to go on duty, and I notified public affairs what was going on. It was really tough to explain it because the, the officer in charge wasn't there. There was a, uh, an NCO there that was like the clerk or whatever you want to say. And I just said simply, I've been contacted by CNN. They want to interview me about an incident that took place in 1980 at this base. Um, please contact the Pentagon and find out what they want me to do. So I went to work. Nothing happened. Went home. Next day came to work. As I was drawing, my flight chief came flying out the door. The door comes banging open. It was, get up to the battle staff now. The commander's on the line with the Pentagon. And I'm like, what? So I go down the hall. Everybody's looking at me. I go into the battle staff area. He's on a secure line. He's looking at me, and he puts it on hold for a second, and he goes, what's going on? I said, sir, until I take the phone call, I can't tell you anything. So I got on the line. It was a general at the Pentagon, and there was a shift commander that was at the Bentwaters at the time by the name of Captain Graham, who was now assigned to public affairs at the Pentagon. They basically read me what had happened, what was taking place. There was a memo released that there were some people talking um, and that that the Air Force didn't want to make it look like a total cover-up. So they couldn't deny it happened because of the memo being released, but that I was to speak with CNN and I was to follow the memo. And I said, well, it would be nice if I saw the memo before I spoke with them. And they said, no, that, you know, that was not the time today's world where they could have sent it to me in a PDF. They said, when he gets, when you get to him, look at the memo and just agree with the memo. And I said, look, at this point, I don't really want to talk about it. I haven't seen the memo. I don't, I'm not wanting to talk about it because what if I don't agree with what, what's being presented? And the general just reminded me who he was and how it could affect my career, and I would I take the meeting. So I agreed. My commander was sitting outside the secure area looking at me, and I just said, well, you know, I got a major here that wants some answers. Can, can you talk to him? He said, yeah, put him on the phone. So he got briefed. I went to work. But shortly after all that started, I got orders for Korea and I wasn't even due. And the, 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 to the get to the final point was after they aired the special assignment report, which they submitted a copy to the Pentagon who sent it to Korea, I had to go into public affairs, sit and review it with OSI. Um, CNN requested a follow-up interview with me to 
get my reaction to it. And they were denied access into Korea or into the, into the, well, Korea where Halt and I were and to talk to Williams about it. There's that threat factor here where he says, if, if I didn't cover it, I would have lost my job. Right. And, and that's very disappointing. It really, really is. But that's just how the world works there. Someone's always going to have dirt on you can be blackmail and people will threaten you to make you do things that they want you to do. And what I found really odd about this segment that John Burroughs had mentioned again on my show, Shifting the Paradigm, you can find it right here on this channel, that entire interview. But he says that there was one particular person that's from CNN that says, yes, you will talk to me. Yes, you will. And John's like, no, I won't. How did you even get my number? Right. And that's that's the thing that I really want to highlight here, because you sometimes deal with journalists that have an insider, right? for the government and they have these connections to get people that they want to come and speak forward or to feed a narrative it doesn't matter what outlet right it's probably in every single one of them and that's one thing that really really caught my attention is if you have good money if you have a good connection right things are going to go your way but there's always going to be consequences for those things the thing is that when you work for someone else uh you have to follow their rules and that's the downfall there you're not really an independent and so that's why it's best to be just like a freelance journalist right like that that's the number one work for nobody but in this case that's one thing that i i did want to mention you need to be careful on what you listen to and who you listen to because you don't really know either their narrative or their agenda or, or who is feeding them information to provide to the public but at the same time i find it even more interesting here that cnn or any media outlet would want to cover it this is 1980 December of 1980, getting into January of 1981. And how did they even get a sniff of this story, right? That's my big question here. But in all of this, in just three weeks after their mysterious encounter, both Penniston and Burroughs were hit hard with severe symptoms that seemed like radiation poisoning and their health just spiraled. And they were plagued by a slew of serious conditions that persisted over three decades. And Burroughs faced a critical heart condition not long after needing both a pacemaker and a defibrillator. And Within, within those weeks, walking became a challenge due to problems with their inner ears and eyes. And a few months down the line, Penniston experienced a shocking change. His gums went completely white, which is a very classic effect of intense radiation exposure. And fast forward to the long-term fallout, Tangled in a web of medical documents and elusive records, Burroughs hit a wall when he found out that the U.S. Air Force had essentially erased him from their records between 1979 and 1982. He was ghosted when a nurse from a private health care facility revealed that she was bluntly denied his medical files and dismissed with there are some things we don't have a need to know. So Burroughs needing, needing answers sought out his medical records through a Freedom of Information Act. And he was targeting the State Department since they had investigated the Bentwaters UFO case as an international incident. And the response was as bizarre as the incident itself. While his records apparently existed, they were under Air Force jurisdiction and out of reach. And when he reached out to the Air Force, they played the ignorance card, claiming they had no such records. What, bros? What are you talking about? Ah, oh, I have never heard of that before. Your medical records? And I don't, I don't have them. Right. And so, of course, this was maddening because you had secretive deadlock. And leaving his medical history caught in an enigmatic loop, 
to where he could not be treated properly. And that's the biggest downfall here was all this time where his information and his medical records were not made public. He could not have been treated properly, which left him with uh, with lifetime health issues. And he also mentioned in the interview that I did with him that he underwent a health, uh, a heart surgery that he didn't have to go through if the doctors had his medical records, which ha were classified during that time frame. And that's something that should never be a thing. But on top of that, it's very sketchy. It's, it's just, it adds just another layer to the story of, well, if it was just the lighthouse, why even bother having those medical records in, in a black vault? Right. Like, what's the purpose behind it? The military or the DOD, I guess you could say, not the Air Force itself was involved with it, were denying my, that I was in the Air Force. They were denying me access to my medical records so the doctors could treat me properly and had all the evidence to support that because there was a senator by the name of Kyle that had started with this and, and had all the letters and documentation showing that they were being stole walled and everything was being covered up, including a letter from Kyle's from Kyle saying my records were classified. My medical records were classified. And which is already just weird, but it's nice to hear it from John Burroughs himself. A little bit earlier, I said, remember about the binary code, because we're going to get back to that. And here we are in that segment of the show. Because it haunted Peniston until he wrote it down in his quarters, which oddly calmed him, as he has mentioned. And he tucked the notes away and he didn't revisit them until 30 years later, which was around 2010. And when finally translated, and this is an actual picture from his notebook, the message was as baffling as the encounter. And the message was exploration of humanity, continuous for planetary advance, eyes of our eyes, origin year 8100. And it was accompanied by, um, it was, it was accompanied by like, some somewhere to look and leading to Earth's mystical site, including a place called High Brazil, known in Celtic lore as a mythical island, an equivalent to Atlantis. And so with these with this, it's just very, very strange. But what's very odd about this aspect of the story is that he didn't share it for 30 years. And then here is those symbols, uh, the hieroglyphic symbols that he copied from the craft that he wrote down. I showed it a little bit earlier, but I saw it in the live chat that people didn't see that. So I'm just going to demonstrate it to you again. So we are getting this. We are getting binary code. And it's very, it's very, very weird here. But this is one aspect of the story where if you've been looking into it for a handful of years, John Burroughs had mentioned that Jim Pennison's story had changed as the years progressed and very specifically when he underwent regression hypnosis. And I just find... and and. We can just take that for face value, right? Take it or leave it. It's just something that it's worth mentioning. Just an extra little tidbit to this story. But on top of that, what I find odd about this is that he didn't share this information for 30 years. Um, was it because he was scared? Was it because he forgot? Was it because he recreated it right from his mind, from his imagination, maybe? This is where this topic gets very difficult to follow and research because, first of all, people are irrational in general. Second of all, your memory is not as good as you think it is. It's fantastic that Holt had a whole cassette recording following everything that he was seeing and doing during that time frame. It's awesome that Peniston had a notebook and he was writing stuff down as things were happening. These are all great details. But the little thing, which is a little bit, I would almost say uncomfortable, is that he didn't share that information for 30 years. And again, th there could be so many reasons why. And I want to hear your insights on why you think that may be. Was it a fear factor? 
was that an, was that a reason was that an aspect to it did he forget like he had mentioned in in a more modern interviews was it just created from his mind let me know in the live chat let me know in the comments because your opinions are very valuable to me and to everyone else that reads them but of course when you do give an answer please explain why you think that's the case right you can't just say it's definitely a because i say so well i think to for a better debate it's it's a because of one two three right that's going to have many people believe what you have to say but looking at today because in response to the growing public fascination with the UFO sighting, the Forestry Commission in 2005 capitalized on lottery fundings to establish a dedicated pathway through Rendlesham Forest, and they named it the UFO Trail. So if you're going to visit that area, please take a picture of this sign or of their of their statue. That's a little... <clears throat> that's a little bit deeper in the forest, which a lot of people have taken some really great pictures. But in today's world, <clears throat> people get their silly little keys and they start etching into that into that metallic sculpture, which is disheartening. It really is how people just need to ruin everything for fun. I don't like that. But aside from that, go go over there to South England, get some pictures, tag me on Twitter at eyes underscore on the skies because I would love to see you visit places such as these. Also, England is nice. You, you get you get nice rainy weather. I love rainy weather and cups of tea. You can't go wrong with those two. And back to back, you've got to have a book and man, you are living the dream for most people, <laughs> for most people. But this is Looking at this case, it's just one that's very profound. It has so many layers, as many UFO stories do. But what really adds a level of credibility is the audio recordings by Holt, Jim Penniston, and John Burroughs coming forward, telling their stories, right? Those aspects are very crucial. It's it's interesting to note that John Burroughs' medical records were classified. The question is why? These... That's what makes this case so enticing for so many people that research this topic. And while everyone's familiar with Roswell, right, the most famous case of all time, while it's interesting, yes, there are other cases, at least in my eyes, that do outshine it. And this is just, it should, this one's just one of those cases. But please let me know what your thoughts are on this case. Do you believe it? Do you not? tell me why what were your favorite aspects of this case what were some details that made you think huh that's interesting or that's weird what was your favorite audio clip please let me know in the live chat please let me know in the comments as well hit that like button if you enjoyed today's show tomorrow is going to be strange news at 3 p.m pst that show will be live so please make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you do not miss tomorrow's show. Also, follow me on Twitter at eyes underscore on the skies for all of my updates and news. But also take a look at my Instagram at strange paradigms where I share pictures and short videos. If you want to continue this conversation, bring it over to the Discord server with 2,000 other like-minded members. Share your thoughts, your insights, your experiences, and more. I know one of my amazing moderators will share that link in the live chat. I want to say thank you to everyone watching this live, all the Super Chats, Super Stickers, YouTube members, Patreon supporters, and of course, all of my amazing moderators. You know I cannot do this show without you. That is it for today. I will see you tomorrow. Be safe, and remember, keep your eyes on the skies.